Hey, this is Catherine Hardwick. I'm the director of Miss You Already, and you're listening to Film Wax Radio. Hey, everybody. This is Adam Sharkoff, your host of Film Wax Radio. This is episode number 414 of the podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed that last episode with Bob Hawk. It seems like uh, people really responded to it. There was a lot of a lot of comments and social media sharing about it. I think Bob Hawk is a real hero. So based on that, I think we're going to have to bring him back real soon. Thank you to to Bob for being so open about his life and uh, his career. He's a special, special guy. Anyhow, this is episode, as I mentioned already, number 414 of the podcast. And on this episode, we're, we have three segments, and uh, so it's a real busy show. We have two documentaries and a foreign language narrative film on this podcast episode. First up here is a special filmmaker uh, based here in, in Brooklyn. She's lived in Asia for good portions of her life as well as here in New York. She went to NYU as a film student and has made a number of shorts over the years. And she has just finally released her first feature film. And it's really special. It's called Popeye. Now, it's spelled with two words, P-O-P and then A-Y-E. In New York, it's currently playing at the very prestigious theater called Film Forum. And for those regular listeners of mine, whether you're living in New York or not, you are probably at this point familiar with the with the theater because we in the last weeks have had on both Bruce Goldstein, who programs the repertory theater there, and uh, Karen Cooper was just on a couple weeks ago. And she, of course, programs contemporary cinema new theatrical releases. So one of those is Popeye. And it's directed again by Kirsten Tan, who is living in and based in Brooklyn. And this new movie is about an a man who is, let's say, sort of transitioning from middle age into older years. He's an architect living in, um, I think it's Bangkok. And he is uh, at a point in experiencing an existential crisis in his life and comes across the elephant that he grew up taken care of on his uncle's farm and he decides he's going to return the elephant to his uncle's farm and of course because getting a lift is not so easy they kind of have to walk most of the way so this is a road movie but a very di very different kind of road movie and it is uh was shot entirely in thailand so but it is a comedy it's a dramedy it's 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 a wonderful film if you are in the new york area do get down to Film Forum because it is currently there. It premiered this past Wednesday. If you're listening to the show, that would have been on uh, Wednesday, uh, the 28th of June. So if you can, try to make it down there. I'm sure it'll be available on other platforms soon enough, but for now, that's where it is. So I want to thank my friends at Kino Lorber who are distributing the film and for always taking such great creative uh, choices and risks and um, thanks to those friends at Film Forum for screening this film and thanks to Kirsten Tan so that'll be coming up in a moment then we're going to have on I'm doing this sort of in order of theatrical release since Popeye's already in theaters they're up first then we have a returning Sierra Pettengill a friend of the podcast she was last on uh, episode number 174 with her co-director Jamila Wigno with their film Town Hall Sierra's back again this time with a new film about relatively contemporary politics called The Reagan Show. It's a complete archive film. We'll get into that in a little bit. She will be joined by Pacho Velez, who is her current uh, co-director on the new film. So we'll be having them up after Kirsten. Oh, and I should mention that film will be opening up June 30th um, in New York and Los Angeles. And then the last up will be uh, Lara Stallman, who is the director of a fabulous new documentary called Swim Team which is about a group of New Jersey New Jersey teenagers who are on a swim team specifically consisting of people on the autism spectrum and it is a fascinating documentary and I'm very glad to bring on the filmmaker Lara Stallman who I have been running into on the film festival circuit recently and so finally glad to bring her on to talk about Swim Team which opens up in New York on the 7th of July Music on this episode is by Kristen Diable uh, off her new album. It's called Create Your Own Mythology, now available. Ran into her performing at the recent Northside Festival in Williamsburg, and I just uh, thought she was terrific. Uh, what a great talent. Uh, the new album, again, is called Create Your Own Mythology. Her name, again, is Kristen Diable, and uh, you can go to kristendiable.com for more details about her album and where she might be performing soon. I wish her much luck. Let's get into this episode 
of the podcast. Again, this is uh, Kristen Tan with her film, Popeye. ไม่ใช่ซื้อมันคุณจะซื้อมันอืมรู้จักมั้ยด้วยเหรอป๊อปไอ้ไงนี่ป๊อปไอ้มันเกินนะนะฉันไม่อยู่เป็นคนดูแ
um, and what I guess life means to each and every one of us. Well, yeah, but but we as an American. First of all, we're talking to mostly Americans, not entirely. Thank you, by the way, if you're not in America for listening, because I, I really appreciate it. So I don't mean to exclude you, but the majority of people listening are Americans, so I kind of trying to appeal to their, spe- right, right, their right. senses in a way. But you're right, and there are universal themes here, and there's a very Thai elephant here in this in this movie. And um, this is your first feature that you've directed. You've done a bunch yes. of shorts. You've done a great job. I mean, it's really, and then, of course, it's going to be a film forum, and they're very, very picky programmers, you know. Karen Cooper doesn't just put anything up on the screen there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, to me, it's a huge, huge honor to be able to play at film forum. It's almost like a dream come true. Yeah. I used to study at NYU, and I would come here quite often to to watch films, and Uh it's almost inconceivable Mm -hmm. for me, like a Singaporean filmmaker, to come all the way to New York and then to have my debut film play here. It's Yeah, it's just... Dream Unbelievable, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure being on Film Wax Radio, my podcast, <laughs> is something also you can never, ever Of course, have. of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway, getting back to my compliment, it is a very, very strong film, and the character, Tana, is a very interesting actor. Is this a, is the man, is Tani, is he a well-known actor in Thailand, by um, the way? He used to be super well-known, but as a rock star. Okay. So he was very oh, famous he's a yeah, in the 70s. And he used to bring... I mean, he brought progressive rock into Thailand. <laughs> but at right? the height of his fame, yeah, at the height of wow. his fame, suddenly he dropped out. And why? he just disappeared from the scene. And kind of like no one knows why. And when oh. I asked him, he's kind of evasive about the question. I don't, maybe he doesn't know the reason himself. Maybe it just got all too much for him. So then I was looking for someone yeah, to play. Yeah, existential crisis. Right. <laughs> Probably, maybe, yeah. yeah. I was looking for someone to play him and, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, to play Tana. And I couldn't find, like, the right guy until someone in the film scene suggested Tane to me. And um, for me, when I saw Tane, he was so different from um, the, the the pictures of him in the 70s. He like, had when you see him hair, now. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure, right? Yeah, exactly. And he had a, big, a lot of facial hair. Yeah, he looks kind of like a Thai Mick Jagger. Yeah. Like, really out there with a cigarette and all his music videos. Very, very edgy and very wild. Yeah. But when you see him now, he's just like this nice, polite, restrained um, old guy. And, uh-huh. and like just like the difference and the juxtaposition between how he was and how he is is really interesting to me. And it just feels to me like he's someone who'd understand life, who'd, who, who would know like the ups and downs and um, the, the heights and glories of life mm-hmm. versus something very ordinary. So then I feel like he would be able to play the role well just because he seems to understand so much. Yeah, he brings a lot of depth. To the performance, yes, yes. And, and did he had he had any uh, roles once, in this? Um, a okay. long time ago, at the height of his fame, so he was probably okay. like in his twenties. And oh. I think he did one Thai TV series, and then he disappeared forever. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, so he has yeah. a bit of mystique around him too, yeah, because he does, of his disappearance. He does. Yeah. Huh. So this is almost a bit like his comeback. Wow. Yeah. That must feel good. What does he think of the? Yeah, he he likes it very much um, because he carries, I guess, so much of it and so much of the film is him too. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like he's very proud of it and he seems happy with it when I talk to him. Did he he appear with you at at any festivals or...? Yeah, at the Singapore premiere, he was there with me, and na- at now at the we're actually having the Thai premiere right now, almost oh. at the same time mm-hmm. as the opening at, of the at Film Forum. Uh-huh. So at Film Forum mm-hmm. is June twenty eighth, and in Thai it's June twenty ninth. So he's going to be fronting oh, are you gonna, the, the Thai. How premiere. are you going to handle? Are you going to be here? Are you, it I'm going to be here. Yeah. Oh, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to make it there in time? I don't think I'll make it there in time because yeah, after tight. yeah after the New York release, I'll have to fly to Taipei Film Festival. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's too bad, but. We're glad you're going to be at the film forum, uh, right? On, yeah, on, is so it on a Wednesday? It. Is that a Wednesday, the twenty eighth? Yes, it's Wednesday. They they premiere on Wednesdays here. Yeah, it's yeah. unusual. Um, yeah, I think maybe they're just trying to. Yeah, I guess yeah. Take advantage of right. of a day. That, yeah, not compete with all the big yeah. big movies that open on on Fridays. Yeah. Again, the name of the movie. I don't know if we even said the name of it, but it's called Popeye. Now let's get to that because that was confusing. Where uh, it's spelled. P O P second word A Y E. Because is that a Thai expression or something? Because yes. there is a lot of references to, of course, Popeye, the car- the American cartoon character. Yeah, yeah. So pa- uh, a pun, Popeye a pun. came comes from Popeye, and it's uh, it, yeah, it's exactly a pun on on that name. And um, and I think it's uh, only because in in Thai language, it's instead of being pronounced Popeye, they pronounced it as Pop Eye. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then so I thought so that just visually it looks yeah it looks interesting as well to yeah. have it. Sp- 
felt in something that doesn't make sense. But yeah. at the same time, I like the kind of off kilter vibe to right. those two words. Yeah, and you would have gotten sued if you called it Popeye. Precisely, <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't do that. <laughs> So it's the the the, uh, the name of the elephant is called Popeye. Uh, again, it, the character of of Tana, he's got a strong going through this strong nostalgic period in his where he's thinking a lot about his childhood, and he wants to bring the elephant back to his uncle's home, the home where he grew up. Right. When right. you get you know there are a number of things that don't quite turn out the way he, he, expects. he expects, and then that you know, but at the same time, the ultimate joke is on on us because nothing turns out to be as exactly as we as it's expected you know as he learns uh, at the end of the movie so i'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger for <laughs> the audience we can't tell you everything that takes place in this film because it would ruin it but by i will say that again bong is is such a this character the popeye is such a wonderful uh you you, you will fall in love with this elephant she has such a uh, he rather has such a quiet you know, graceful beauty to him, and and, right, and right. you really do feel like he he's performing on some level, yeah, through a non-performance. Yeah. I think I think to me it was just important to capture him truthfully, without me trying to inject like too much human characteristics into him, yeah, because I feel like it's so. <laughs> It's almost so tempting to make him really yes. cute, to make him really lovable. Yes. But for me, I, in some ways, I was just trying to avoid that and just trying to, I, I guess, shoot him and capture him in a way yes. that was really truthful to him. And I feel like because of that, then a, 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 um, a very natural, innate kind of beauty of the elephant would just naturally come come through. Yeah, you succeeded really wonderfully. But you really see this intelligence at the same time. It, it, you were there on the set, obviously. Uh, you got to know the elephant really well. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, they're supposed to be very intelligent. And do, yeah, he's do, super, did you really get that sense? Smart. That yeah. he, Do you get a sense? Because we do, in the, again, in the movie, you get a sense that Popeye really understands what yeah. Tana is is going through and what his needs are and he really tries to compensate not only just that there's one moment where somebody, you know, where he needs water and then, you know, Right, right, right. The elephant sprays, you know, there's two occasions, actually, because mm -hmm. there's this accident also, right? But, uh, so you get the sense that the elephant really does understand. Yeah, Do you think yeah. there's um, any of that that exists, yes, or are you using um, a little on, bit on of On set, is, it was really license? clear to me that an, ele an elephant is pretty, pretty intelligent. I would say almost in between, like, human and dogs. I feel like they actually understand more than dogs. I mean, personally, I'm a dog lover. I used to have like three or four dogs at home, so I, I know them pretty well. And, uh -huh. and the, the really interesting thing to me working on this film is seeing that each elephant has very distinctive personalities. Okay. And once you know them, you can their being and who they each are as individuals starts to feel very, very clear. And that became clear to me while I was casting and looking for, um, looking for someone to play um, Popeye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so I mean the reason I ended up with Bong was that I was very moved by his um, somehow his personality. He felt like a really kind and generous, and almost slightly mischievous elephant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I like like kind of like the vitality he brings into the role. Was there anything that in his personality that you didn't bring into the movie though? Like that we don't know that exists because we do get a sense of intelligence of 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 tenderness. Yes, yes. I'm not saying he can't get riled up if somebody yeah, spooks yeah. him because that's the nature of uh, you know just any any animal. But yeah, I, I think the the really cool thing and maybe the obvious thing working with an animals is realizing that they are never acting; they are always just in this constant state right. of being. Yeah. So for for me, I don't think there was much I could push in terms of inserting other characteristics into his being. Uh, he was just or being out himself. of it, or take away anything. Maybe there is more to him outside of the role. Maybe yeah. that we don't like. Yeah. The, maybe he's. I, I guess the only slight change between the real Bong and the yeah. Papa in the film is that. Uh, Bong only makes one sound. He he oh. likes to make this really high pitched. Wait, oh, that's in the film. This, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the only sound he makes. That's unusual. Yeah, it's really unusual. So is that unusual for an elephant? Is that? Yeah, I think it's pretty unusual because when I meet other elephants, they it, make other sounds. Too. It's usually yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then in, in post, and when we're doing sound design, we had to it's give him like, like other other like. Uh, is it in the voice. trailer? Uh yeah yeah because I, I maybe I'll play a little of the trailer even though it's a foreign language. Yeah. Uh, it's this whale like in a little bit, uh, but you know, it might remind you of a whale song a little because there's it's a kind of high pitched. It reminds me there's a story about there's this one whale 
Apparently that his frequency of his cries are so different. They're at a right. different... Do you know about this story? Oh, yes. Like, he's the only yeah, whale in right. the world who can... Yes. Yeah, he, he's unable to communicate with other whales. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he's I, the I lonely, the lonely whale. So yeah, sad. it's great. Yeah, it's the lonely whale story. But so kind of reminded me of that. But the, uh, speaking of another comparison of just because of the timing of the film is opening up right around the time of Okja as well, oh, which is yes. about a large... A super pig. Smart loving companion type of animal yeah, to an I Asian seen, oh, character. Yeah. It's just kind of love to. it's very good. I saw it. You saw it? Oh yeah. lucky yeah. you. I'm a big fan of Bong. Yeah. yeah. The elephant, but also Bong Jun Ho, who is <laughs> the director of Okja. So it's a coincid- <laughs> series of coincidences. There's a lot of coincidences. And the pig is also supposed to be an uh, an intelligent highly intelligent animal. And the pigs that are genetically mutated in the Okja in the Bong Jun Ho film is more outwardly like an elephant in the sense of that the right. size of it as well as mm-hmm. his uh the character of the the animal right. as right. opposed to like a normal pig squealing and playing yeah, the mud yeah. they don't really care about humans too much you know right. but uh, so 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 if you liked okja if you see it then go see also uh, you're gonna love pop eye right. which is uh the film we've been talking yeah. about and uh I remember when I when I first met Bong, the the first thing that struck me, of course, was his size, and um and I guess like just standing beside him, the way his he sounds, um and and all of a sudden in that instant, I totally understand why through through the history of mm-hmm. men, you know, like, yes. like elephants, especially in Asia, is used almost or, or is almost always associated with royalty, with majesty. They are almost like an, an animal that's always associated with the gods. Yes. And, and standing beside him, I, I totally understood why. It's just his wow. presence. I can't imagine it because he seems... It's so cool. Like, yeah. yeah, his presence, like, yeah, and just the way he sounds, it's... It, it's really deep and yeah 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 it's different when you're in because you see the you know in the zoos or circuses both of which i can't wait till they're things of the past i mean yes, i think yes, we've yes. seen the i think we are seeing at the end of circuses here in the country yes i mean i certainly hope so and then as far as zoos go i think it's a little it's a little trickier if they're true preservational spots then i'm, I'm a little bit more sort of sensitive to it right but you know for 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 sh- performative purposes yeah. we've reached the end of that period i hope yeah and you so kind of re- don't please. really see animals in their true state in their right. true essence in their true yeah. character anyway. exactly. so isn't that what we want really sense. Yeah, yeah it's true yeah. but we also do want to interact with them because then kids do grow up into being environmentalists because they right. they That's learn true. to meet the elephant and they really it's different than seeing it on a tv or right, in, right, even right. in an exceptional movie like yours see how i did that uh <laughs> 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 it's really great talking to you does anybody interview you and not ask you as much about the elephant? Because it should seems like it seems to me like you can't. Uh, no, yeah, this is this is a, a very casual and nice interview. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and oh, everyone yeah. is kind of different. Yeah, I know, I know. And you'll come back on because I, I have to run in a minute. But I would love to do another one, maybe your next film or. But yeah, anyway, sure. Kirsten Tan is the uh, filmmaker. New Yorker, Brooklynite. It's very nice to meet you. And the name of the movie is it's Popeye, and it's going to be at Film Forum on uh, June 28th, at least for a week. If a lot of people go, they'll hold it over. There's a movie that's just ending today that's uh, called, uh, I forget now, it's with uh, Kate Blanchett, uh, Manifesto, which has been here for like five weeks because audiences have come out and supported the movie. So you love Kate Blanchett, you're going to love Bong. That's my, and, and Tana, Tani, Tani. Ta- uh, Tana in the film and Tani, Tani the actor. and the actor. Yeah. Well, it's good to have him back. You know. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's really nice talking to you. Okay, segment number two again with uh, the uh, filmmakers Sierra Pettengill and Pacho Velez regarding their new film. It's called The Reagan Show. It is completely told through archival material uh, regarding the period of time, I guess, in Reagan's. A presidential career where the final days of the Cold War, I guess you could say. So it's during the specific period where Gorbachev is leading Russia and uh, the Soviet Union is falling apart. And it's a really fascinating film. And, it, and it's also, I should say, even more so about the branding and marketing of that which is the entity of the president, which we can all relate to at this point in life. I <laughs> mean, I don't know if it'll help give some context to what the current chaos that we're dealing with, this craziness. This is a fabulous documentary. I'm a big fan of, of Sierra and uh, Pacho at this point with this film. So let's get right into it. The film will be premiering this Friday, June 30th at the Metrograph Cinema. 
in New York City. It's a great theater, by the way. Go check it out, Metrograph. Google that if you want to, but it's going to be there for a good week. And then it'll also be playing at the Lemley Playhouse 7 in Pasadena, California, uh, on the, starting on the 7th as well. So people on both coasts will have the opportunity to see it. Okay, here we go. My conversation with Sierra Pettengill and Pacho Velez regarding their new documentary, The Reagan Show. Okay, recording. The Reagan administration will be remembered for excelling in public relations. I think that he has captured the imagination of the American people because of his ability to communicate. To be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving the peace. That's why New Hampshire needs John Sununu, <coughs> Sununu. Together, we'll make America great again. I think appearance is very important, but it's also staging. It's how you stage the message. Okay, how are you doing, Sierra? Welcome back to the uh, podcast. It's good to speak on the podcast just by nodding at you, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you're very visual. Uh, Yeah, what was it? So how long has it been since Town Hall? Because you were on with Jamila Wingo. Uh, Four years. Uh uh, Is that four years ago already? Come on. Yeah, that I haven't been doing the podcast that long. The Obama administration. Well, <laughs> all right, but that was a year ago. It does. It's, yeah. Well, it's a, it's interesting because yeah, it's we look at Reagan in the context of this time we're in now, almost nostalgically. Well, certainly nostalgically, but almost romantically in a sense of like maybe it was even better with Reagan. You know, I'm yeah, sure you now? get that a lot. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a funny experience we had while making the film is that we were making it for over three years. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the election yep. and inauguration happened at the very end of the filmmaking So you're process. still in production or the post-production? Which the was, whole film's post-production. It's all post-production because so, yeah, it's, it's all one blurry, it's all, it's all one blurry, blurry line, archive, of, yeah. um, which is your area of expertise, one of your areas of expertise. Right? Thank you. Um, but as we... You know, we spent all this time looking, you know, with a critical eye towards the Reagan administration. And then as we, as sort of Trump started to look more and more likely, the Reagan presidency Wait a minute, what are you saying? Started... Trump is one? <laughs> is this just stand-up? You can just do stand-up. Um, well, maybe but... I will see by the end of this. Oh, God. I haven't been able to do an impression in years of Reagan, Jesus. so you've given me the opportunity. Well, yes. Nancy and I were... So the second half of my sentence. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. I'm excited. I know. It's hard not to be excited about Ronald Reagan. So, but as we, yeah, as we, as Trump was taking up more and more of the news and then eventually became president, the Reagan administration started to look rosier and rosier, which was something that was not what we were anticipating as we were making the project. It's like levels of Dante's Inferno or something. Maybe it's just a little bit down, you know. Hopefully we're at the seventh level because I can't imagine getting worse yeah, than this. Uh, hotter, yeah. So we're talking to Sierra Pettengill, as most people listening now know, or have probably figured out. And silently <laughs> sitting next to her, at her immediate left, is, is Pacho Velez. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And thank you for, for coming and doing the podcast. Together you've co-directed The Reagan Show. Which is premiering uh, Friday, the thirtieth of June, at the at the Metrograph. Metrograph. The, oh, what, how fantastic! Yeah, that's down, right. Down, um, down on, on the Lower East Side. Right, right. It's just by Canal the, Street. The Lemley Pasadena oh, in good. L.A. Okay, great. Well, well done, Susan Norgan. That's all I can say in terms of helping. And then, and then, who's distributing the film now? Gravitas. Uh, Gravitas. Gravitas. Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, just a few minutes ago, Sarah, you have also a background in, in archive. You've done, worked on other films in the, in the, with that hat, right? So did that, I mean, how, I'm the question is how, how much the project that, start? Yeah. Um, uh, so Pacho actually found... Sit down, Pacho. Don't go, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Pacho actually found um, this Reagan archive, which is at the Ronald Reagan um, Presidential Library, Okay. Um, which was an archive of footage shot by the Navy under this department called the White House Television Office, which Uh documented everything Reagan did over eight years. Um, And uh, and he and um, Dan Garber, who's our amazing editor, one of our amazing editors, Mm -hmm. um, started looking at that footage um, with an eye towards 
looking at Reagan through performance and acting. Um, sorry to answer for you, Patra. Oh yeah, no, Patra. No, it's fine. I kind of am curious to hear your your uh, your telling of it. So. Accurate so far. Um, yeah, and then I <laughs> and then I came on um, a bit after that. But yes, it's all archival. We looked at a thousand hours of footage um, mm-hmm. between our team and. How long does that take? <laughs> Just kidding. Three point five years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You told me years. I'm just saying. Look at a thousand hours. How long does that? It was a joke, but but uh, more of my stand up. They're, they're very good jokes. <laughs> no, I know. Um, I'm. I appreciate your uh, humoring me, though. Uh, all right. So, how, how, and how did you guys? Did is this how you met? Then is that how you met? Like through we, this we met project? at uh, an art of the real screening. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Up at Lincoln Center. Up at Lincoln Center. Dennis Lim. Dennis Lim. Yeah. Uh, we were at a table afterwards uh, chit-chatting. Um, and uh, I think I invited Sierra to come uh, be a guest artist at my, my class at Bard College. Oh, I was you teach at Bard? There. Okay. Yeah, I was there uh, that I, I semester. Went there. Oh, great. So we can move on. <laughs> um, and we just, uh, Sierra and I started talking, and it, um, Sierra has a very deep interest in uh um yeah presidential biography i know it's terrific yeah um <laughs> i do too it's how i perfected all my i can do impressions of all the presidents pretty much we just do that can you can you do any no do either of you? no but i was can gonna you? ask for your your coolidge impersonation <laughs> <laughs> well since nobody can challenge me on it <laughs> i actually been doing coolidge so thank you for picking up on that well, the Reagan Show is archive. It focuses primarily, I would say, on the years where Gorbachev was in Russia, running the country, and the final years of the Soviet Union. So you could say it was maybe at the, the cusp of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, correct? Which is a really, really fascinating period of time. One wants to know, well, what, what did that look like? And especially now there's been, it's what, 30 years? And it's, it's also a moment that I think... Um, is is both obviously a key mm-hmm. historical moment, but also a moment that sort of is is maybe not as examined as certain other moments during the during the Reagan presidency. You know, obviously people who love Reagan love to talk about the assassination attempt. Mm-hmm. They love to talk about the eighty four election. People who really immensely dislike Reagan talk talk about his response to AIDS. They talk about yeah. um, the air traffic controllers strike. They talk about Iran Contra. Um, and so this is a sort of a moment that, in some ways, um, overshadowed. Yeah, falls falls between the cracks sometimes, mm-hmm. even though it changed the world and the, and the whole geopolitics of the world, right? Yeah. The years of I mean, I think this is part, um, you know, part of what helps cement Reagan's legacy is his sort of success in in this realm. And one of the things that was interesting to Pacho and I was taking a look at. Um, you know, more broadly, like how narratives get established. And so that's something mm. the film's doing. So we wanted to to look at that idea of this being something that helped cement his legacy. This is, you know, a, is a, a large success um, and how look at the tools that made it happen. So looking at how that legacy was able to be formed and, you know, um, as the film shows, that's largely through PR and, um, and images and and the way that the Reagan administration was creating media to help tell their story. So, you know, the film is about kind of the storytelling of the of the end of the Cold War. Before branding was called branding in a way, like right, right, in right. his presidency was branded. When they started kind of figuring out how to do that and how to affect people's impressions and the people's opinion, and therefore controlling people. <laughs> And outcomes of elections and other things like that. Right, and here we are. Here we are today. Yeah, there would be no Trump without without Reagan, I think. Definitely, it starts there. Yeah, and I mean, there's obviously there's a, there's a number of sort of moments that you can point to as the start of the sort of entertainmentalization or spectacleization of politics. You can mm-hmm. also, you can also point to uh, the the Kennedy Nixon debates in '60. Um, mm-hmm. You can point to the selling of the president and Richard Nixon and his work with Roger Ailes in '68, mm-hmm. um, but but clearly the the Reagan administration was and their sort of their openness to public relations and in fact in many ways they're sort of privileging a public relations over the actual business of governing. 
mm-hmm. um, or rather treating public relations as though it were synonymous with governance. Um, uh, definitely was a, a way station um, on the path to where we are today. And I mean, kind of unfortunately, probably where we're headed in the future. Mm. Just getting back to when you're saying how you give a lot of context to this lesser known period, maybe overshadowed period because of the, maybe the same uh, reasons of like how things are just so packaged and marketed. That whole period has been reduced to one line in, in our collective memory, which is Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall, which is a very, you know, emotional provocative. It's a great moment undeniably, but now we have, because of the Reagan show, we have a, a, a much broader context of, the, of what was going on during that period. This is fantastic archive stuff that you guys have unearthed. And, and Josh Alexander is a buddy of mine. He oh. uh, He's hanging out with us at, uh, at DCTV, too. I know Josh for many years, and um, I know he started off as an actor and as a kind of a fiction filmmaker, and now he's sort of evolved into this uh, documentary writer. writer. Yeah. So how, does, how did that, <coughs> how, you know, like, did you guys... Reach. How'd you know about him? And I worked and with what, him on another project. Which one was that? Um, <coughs> prescription thugs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah, I mean, Pacho is also a writer on the film, um, and uh, one of our editors, Francisco Bello. Uh-huh. You know, f- a film like this is all, as we were saying, post production, and so the writing element is a pretty heavy one. You know, we're we went through, it took so long because we went through so many different Mm -hmm. kind of iterations and, um, you know, when you don't have any outside voices, be it interviews or, you know, narration or um, there are very few interventions in the film. It's all archival telling the story. It's that kind of writing actually feels maybe counterintuitively. It's more important. And so Josh came in at the, um, at the end and, and it's organizational. To some degree, right? Is that what you're saying? It it kind of organizes the material in in such a way to make it, it yeah, I mean, more it's, like it's, a story, right? And it's you know, it's making sure that you have enough context at any given moment to allow the scenes to be readable. And in this film, you know, we wanted the viewer to be looking for and looking at performance and acting and seeing each scene through that lens. And in order to do that, you have to kind of set set them up well enough so that by the time you get to kind of the meat of the Gorbachev story and the negotiations, you're able to look for those things in those scenes. And so mm-hmm. that, I think that's a lot of what we were trying to do is get there. But I don't... Uh, Pacho, uh, was the was it anywhere in your purview, in, in your mind frame to try to also take, I don't know if, if you're... you're uh, impression of Ronald Reagan as a president, as a person, as a terrible actor, I don't know. But if, if, <laughs> if you had, if at some point it had evolved in some way, and if you were trying to also incorporate this into your film and the perception of him, uh, I don't know. Or maybe during the making of the film, mm-hmm. uh, your impression altered in some way. I'm just curious to know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's a film that's sort of as much about the archive and the image that Reagan projects and sort of the circulation between that image and the ways that the media abets that image making while also critiquing it. And so there's a, there's a way that, that that was sort of the, I think in many ways, sort of the, the, the focus or, or getting at that sort of way that there's a kind of image that Reagan's projecting and then the media is like picking up on that image and sort of critiquing it, but also using it for their own ends and using it for their own sort of media spectacle, which then gets recycled into Reagan watching TV, which is part of the film, of course, too. Yeah. Um, and then gets regurgitated in this other form. And so there's a sort of circulation or cycling between Reagan and the media that both is about a kind of critique, but also about a, a kind of way that the, the two sides need each other, a kind of codependency mm-hmm. um, that's developing over the 80s. And so even the, while a lot of the explicit language is a language of critique, um, hopefully the film also captures the ways in which there's a kind of circulation of Reagan's image between these two different media spheres. Um, and that's something that I think was really important to capture in the edit. And in that way, it's it's much more about 
the public face of Reagan and how Reagan was understood in the 80s yes. to the American public than it is a film about the private Reagan. It's no, not. I understand. It's right. not the, We're not doing, know, yeah, we don't go there. Yeah, you don't really go into the residence too much. Yeah. Yeah, and one of, one of the things um, that we talked about a lot was that, you know, there's Reagan, the interiority, the concept of interiority with Reagan is like a kind of infamously impossible thing to crack um and all of his biographers have uh, expressed a you know frustration, incredible yeah. frustration yeah there's a limit to how close you can get his nancy said you know you get so close and then something happens there's you know there's a real limit to understanding him from a sort of typical biopic right biopic uh <laughs> psychological what you know perspective and so we myopic. we thought myopic <laughs> we thought the way you know, someone who's been in front of the camera for, you know, all of their adult life, the, yeah. one of the best ways to actually image him, is, to understand him, is to look at the images that he's creating right. and producing. And so yeah. that was our I just wondered, way of reading. I understand. But I was wondering, because you said something like, three, how many thousands of, how, much, how many hours did you say? I think it was, clo- it was close to a thousand between thousand. the TV news and the... Um, okay. Because it's, I was just wondering, because he is so enigmatic... And it's he seems to the degree where he seems enigmatic to himself as well. Like he doesn't really have a sense of. We don't get a you know we don't think I don't get the impression that he has a sense of who he really is. Even though yeah, he, the branding he of him, he's, he's the dad. He's the, mm-hmm. father, the he's the father of the country. And you, you read know. his books and you you know listen to his interviews. And he doesn't he doesn't go in for introspection in right. a big way. Yeah, but he you know and he was this Hollywood actor at the height of the golden years of Hollywood, and he played. Cowboys, and he played right, uh, you know, occasionally like a gangster, I suppose, or something like that. But he, sure, I think he was in fifty-seven films, and only one of them did he play a bad guy. His very last one. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the one. He I smacks like. around Andy Dickinson. Well, yeah, he gets punched by Cassavetes. It's a Don Siegel's <laughs> The Killers, nineteen sixty. Oh wow, what a great little in, um, intersection of of uh, the old and the new, huh? Isn't it? Because he's like on his way out. As John Cassavetes is, yeah, it's a it's a good clip. Angel. Yeah, <laughs> I got to go back and see that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I like the uh, uh, the the connection to Don Siegel too, since they just remade another one of his movies. Sure, the Beguiled. Yeah, the Beguiled. Go ahead. So this is all the way of saying. Him. Yeah, I think Sofia Coppola for president, two thousand twenty, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't. That sounds just as good as anyone to me at this point. Yes, let's try a woman. See how that goes. Seemed as though we clinched it there for a second or so. I mean, what do we make of that? I mean, you know, we can talk about in a way the this artificiality about polls that mean nothing. What is all that about? Are they none of the polls meant anything. So aren't we still lost in this kind of artificial political sphere all these years later? I mean, isn't it just all still? Yeah, branding? I mean, we. Yeah, and I don't. I think Trump is kind of the like metastatized version of <laughs> yeah. you know kind of an inevitable rotting <laughs> um, of the system. But, you know, like I said, we didn't know this was coming, and yeah. we st- we thought of this project as being a way of looking at the roots of the present tense. Okay. And, um, you know, you can you can trace all presents after him. You know, as yeah. Peter Jennings says at the very end of our film, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> you know, I shudder to think what presidents are going to have to do after Ronald Reagan on television, on the, in the realm of television, sure. and I think that's... But do we think... I feel like if uh, Obama, on the other hand, really had a great sense of who he was. You know, maybe I'm just not that... Maybe I'm not just not that smart, but I, I, I just don't have a sense. Don't have to go there. But I just didn't get a sense that this was somebody who was manipulating or being manipulated as much or to that degree. Yeah. <laughs> Hopeful thinking. Well, I, I mean, I, th- I think I think of it as more than a kind of left or right thing, or more than a, a, a sort of yeah way of talking about it in terms of any sort of particular person. It's much okay. more about a kind of like systemic or sort of epical change that we're seeing. And okay. uh, Adam Curtis talks about it a lot. And it's Who? I, Adam, Curtis, Adam the, Curtis, the documentarian Adam Curtis. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And the British guy. Right? British guy. Yeah. I um, interviewed him, so I don't really know him that well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, his films. There's a lot yeah. to, to dislike in those films, and there's a lot of ways that he's way too bombastic in other ways. But he has a sort of a very sort of succinct way of talking about how in the '70s politics went from being um, 
connectivity of the nuanced description of a complicated reality to being about presenting simplified narratives. And he really talks about Thatcher and Reagan as being the sort of the birth of this, the sort of this, the sense of politics as a space for the feel good, simple narrative, us and them, good and evil. Um, and that that kind of simplified language has sort of found its way into politicians on all sides of the aisle um, to varying degrees. And so that's, that's, what we're we're seeing right now, I think, and it's, and right. Reagan Reagan is is sort of um, he's very good at it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's whether he knew it or not, I think he just naturally gravitated into that role so well and being like that guy because I just think he, that was his comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I that. think it's also important that this is the Reagan administration also is coinciding with you know advances in in media technology and right. the rise of CNN and. Mm -hmm. Kind of the beginning, it's the very beginning of the 24-hour news network. And so the sort of ability to have your image, you know, present and communicated um, all the time is a, is a new opportunity. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously yeah, love him and hate him. stroll of television news. Love him and hate him ails. Well, we hate him. But ails, uh, you know, definitely was was visionary in that regard. He saw yeah, that. Yeah, he saw that right, before yeah. just about anybody, right? So. Yeah. Unfortunately, you can harness yeah, it for good. A, you that, can that trace knowledge. this entire yeah, yeah from Nixon on forward, right. just just through rail. So amazing, right? There's another documentary for you, and he'll be in break. it. He'll figure it out somehow or other. I'm sure he'll be in it. So holograms. Uh, so you you were at. Where, 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 oh, go ahead. No, oh, yes, yeah, so I mean, one one reason that we were able to make this film is because in the U.S. Yeah. Once someone's passed away, there are um, they're not protected by libel laws. <laughs> right. so you don't have to worry about being sued. Yeah, I redact that. <laughs> oh, so tell me. So you were at some event where it was at a screening. You said, and then uh, Chris Matthews came. Or is that you're one? eavesdropping on a um... eavesdropping? You were talking about <laughs> it out loud in front of me. I, know, I don't know yeah. if that's it. <laughs> I'm having coffee now, so I'll be less snarky in like three. You minutes. can be snarky. I'm, um... I first of all, I come to expect a certain amount of snark. I don't say that critically. I know this woman for a couple of years, four, at least four now, at least maybe more. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy her snark. my reputation. Yeah, good snark, <laughs> lady. Um, it's okay. I don't have a good story about that. Yeah, okay. he came to the I didn't you see didn't? him or interact. Oh, or, he just yeah, showed, just but it's a, good to know. Yeah. I was wondering if, if uh, I mean, it's still a little early, although you've been through a bunch of uh, festivals, obviously. Where did it premiere again? Tribeca. Tribeca Film Festival. I guess that's how I saw it. Was that, oh, so that's it? Um, was there, uh, was we it, where, 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 Tribeca, uh, AFI Docs in DC, oh, okay. Nantucket. Um, oh, well, that's going on now, right? Seattle, SF Docs okay. in San Francisco. So quite a, okay, good bunch. Oh, Alliance. Montclair. Oh, right, yeah, all great festivals. And has any have you, any politicians had a chance to see it? I don't know if anybody in the or media, big media, like we're just kicking off. Yeah, so. yeah. Checking on fire. Not that this has to be included, but is there a broadcast or anything like that set up? Or It'll be on CNN in um, right. September. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay, but we're not talking about that because mm. right now we want to get you to go to <laughs> the uh, Metrograph Theater, which is uh, a wonderful theater. I suppose this isn't going to be projected on film, but they do have that capacity. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, this whole film yeah, is yeah. made out of... You know, uh, yeah, standard def. That would have been odd to go from video to, to yeah. two. Right? It's it was the only all, film I've almost ever worked on video. where we talked all the way through about down resing. Down resing. Yeah, we're anytime yeah. we got sort of an HD photo, we'd have to go through a long process of oh. mucking it up to look as bad as possible. Interesting. Okay, so it's gonna be at the Metrograph. Go to the Metrograph Theater because it's a fantastic theater. If you haven't gone yet, go June thirty. The weekend of June thirtieth is a great time to go. Us New Yorkers that are stuck in New York here this weekend are going to go to the Metrograph Theater. Let's all get together and head on down to the Metrograph and see the Reagan show. And I believe you're going to get Reagan there. I think he's going to come. Also a hologram, yeah. <laughs> and if you're in uh, the Los Angeles area, it's going to be at the Lemley Pasadena Theater, I'm told. It's the same day? Yeah. And okay. uh, Josh Alexander, the writer, aforementioned yeah. writer, is going to do the q and yeah. Josh Alexander, who has been on this podcast, I don't, I'll have that information for people. So if they want to meet him, through because he came on around the time of uh, subscription, uh, prescription, prescri excuse me, prescription I think he did thugs. Is that what's called? Prescription thugs. Magazine. <laughs> <It> just happened. <laughs> there is a movie about that. Um, 
No, what's the one? Uh, what's her name? She just did it with the girl, and they go. They these teens, oh, a American bunch of honey. American <laughs> Honey. Thank you very much. So I don't. I have to prepare psychologically, but they go around and they're subscription thugs. Wouldn't you say? Uh, it's I a group of marauding. Right, it's a group of marauding. Um, wonderful trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Post millennial marauders who go around trying to thrust subscriptions on you know unknowing and people in, in the suburbs. Again, the Reagan show. It's it's wonderful for anybody who's like a, this subject matter we've been talking about. If you're into it, this is going to be like candy for you. So just check it out. And thank you very much, guys, for uh, thank you for coming on and thank you putting up with my my Michigas and my my impressions. But I've been too- can we hear Reagan one more time? He will, Mister Gorbachev, Mister Gorbachev, please. Oh no, he wouldn't say please. <laughs> Tear down that wall. <laughs> Yes. Your, fa- your yes. facial expressions are remarkable. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Again, for the benefit of my yeah. listeners. Uh, well, I don't know what it is. I just It's one of those that he just, I get him. I get his whole. What about H.W. Bush? Uh, I would be doing more like an impression of like probably like closer like a Dana Carvey kind of thing. You know, which so I don't. He's just, it's so ubiquitous that impression that you can't just, I have to go back and do my work. Okay. I'll work on it. Okay. And my Donald Next Rumsfeld. Film. Much, much underappreciated for for his his ability to be impersonated susan you have something you want to say <laughs> <laughs> all right guys anyway i'll let you go thank, thank you. you very much appreciate it last up here segment number three lara stallman filmmaker of the documentary called swim team i've already mentioned that it's about a, a group of autistic teenagers who comprise a swim team in new jersey and this is their story it's a it's a very very uh, engaging an entertaining film, I should mention. It is not a downer. It's being distributed by my friend Jim Brown's company, Argo Pictures. And it uh, will be in New York at the IC Center beginning uh, this uh, the 7th of July. And then it will be premiering in California at the Lemley Monica Theater in uh, uh, so the 13th of July and other select, select cities. You can Google Swim Team. And you can get all the details of that as well. It's also, she's at the films on Facebook and uh, Twitter, etc. So this is my conversation with the lovely filmmaker, Lara Stolman. Guys, give the best that you got. Who's oh, with God. me? Hammerhead! Hammerhead! Some kids, they stare at me, who's this fast kid? The front show may be a little bit tough, but the breast show may be really hard. As I know autistic means. Some person that's different than other kids. Our team, they have some type of autism spectrum disorder, which is not very common for a swim team. You're gonna swim if it kills me. Coaching a special needs team versus a regular swim team, it's night and day. I know, I know the tick ball. Lara Stolman, we we met at um, at a party for Doc NYC. It was like a little party in advance, right, of Doc NYC, where your film, which we're going to get to in a second, where it had its New York premiere, New York City premiere, New York premiere. And then we met again at Montclair, which is one of your hometown, if you want to call it that, home state screenings. The name of the film now is called Swim Team, which is a, a, a wonderful documentary. Thank you. <laughs> It's won a bunch of awards I I see. Like it, it goes to a festival and just usually wins some big award there, typically. We've People really lucky. respond to it. We've been really lucky. Is it luck when you're when you put years into a project? Oh, you know, thank you. It, it's you hope that it's going to be well received. Um mm-hmm. and uh you know, you it, it, but you never know because um so much is subjective, right? About film and uh well yeah, it's true, but usually a well-made film gets enough people to respond in such a way where there's a commercial benefit to it. You know, there's a it, enough people will see it and talk about it in a positive way. The reviews are good. So there's that that's a phenomenon that occurs, too, to films that are well-made. Okay, so I'm just saying, I, you know, not to have a swim team and 
particular. Uh, it just happens to be an example. But any film. So you just came from POV before you came here. Yes, yes. And uh, so that's a big piece of news right there. Yes, we'll be broadcast on POV in the fall. So we're so, I'm really thrilled about that. Just vaguely now in the fall? We don't have a date. No, actually, I do have a date, oh, October 2nd. Oh, wow. Okay, people, take a moment. We're going to give you a moment. Dead airspace, just to put in your calendar, October second for the broadcast premiere of Swim Team, and we don't even we haven't even talked about what it's about. We are all we know is it's it. And as I mentioned with many other filmmakers over the years that have been on this podcast that have had the benefit of having their film play on POV or their other the uh, their sister show on public broadcasting, you know, it really means such a larger number, a larger audience. So it's really yes, for yes. a small film it's see it's a great great opportunity. It's it is and and that's one of the reasons why I'm so thrilled is you know now m- many people will have the opportunity to experience the story. Mhm. And the story, let's get to that cuz I've been putting that off. It is in fact about a swim team which is based in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, correct? Right. And it consists of not your typical swimmers. No, no. Each swimmer on the team is on the autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. Some of the kids actually have additional diagnoses. Uh, but they are all on the autism spectrum, so it's uh, it's an unusual swim team. Mm. In my lifetime, I've seen a couple of things occur, and it's a pendulum phenomenon. One is that we used to discard uh, anyone with any kind of problems like autism, if in fact one wants to describe it as a problem. But people with autism, if they were indeed even diagnosed as such, they were treated in in such a way where they weren't even an opportunity to enter mainstream activities like joining a swim team. Then it seemed as though once we realized there is this diagnosis, uh, there was a swing the other way where we were maybe treating people too preciously, where, you know, it was interrupting any time, by the way, because it was like, you can't let these people swim, they'll drown. And, And now we're finding something in the middle here. It wasn't that long ago that people on the autism spectrum were shipped off to institutions. Right. You know, for many people, the point of reference is still Rain Man. And that, in fact, was about a character living in an institution. And that was the norm for people, not just with autism, with but with developmental disabilities for, you know, for a long time. And it really, it, it, it wasn't that long ago that that was the norm. Um, and still so many people are with de- with developmental disabilities and specifically autism are excluded from all aspects of our community life starting with public school they're excluded from you know a gen ed classroom and mo- for most of the kids on the team actually you know they hadn't been in a general education classroom as children as young children and they hadn't been exposed to community sports mm-hmm. most of the kids on the team hadn't been on on a on a community sports team until this team. I guess I, I was thinking that being overly precious with people that are on the spectrum, that we're to some degree doing them a disservice. We should put them in the mainstream school system, find a place for people with, on the on the spectrum in schools and on swim teams and in other areas of life because they may do exceptionally well. It may be, such, it may be so much of a benefit to them. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Not just to... Uh, try to protect them to such a degree yeah and i i think that's you know definitely what this film is about we have characters that kind of run the gamut in terms of the severity of of their disability um and or disabilities because one of our main character main characters has not just autism but tourette's and um you know his disabilities are are very disruptive to his family his family's family life his experience in the world uh, and, you know, I think this film is very much about the fact that, you know, even individuals, you know, that need a tremendous amount of support still mm-hmm. have things to contribute to our communities. And, you know, they, right. should, they shouldn't be excluded. Yeah. And how are we ever going to treat people different from ourselves less differently <laughs> if we don't interact and experience these people uh, like anyone else? That's my thought. Mm-hmm. You know, I prefer it that way. You know, I don't need everybody to be exactly the same. And by the way, uh, you said this one one child, what's his name? The one that has both uh, autism and Tourette's. Kelvin. Kelvin. Degrees to Kelvin, right? I mean, you're not a doctor. You're nope. a filmmaker. 
<laughs> correct? Yeah, I'm not a doctor. Do you have a medical degree? Okay. Much um, to my parents' chagrin, <laughs> I am not a doctor. <laughs> oh, well. But are these two things connected in any way? Were they? Are they connected? You know, that's an interesting question, and I haven't been asked that question. I did do a little bit of research, though, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I was wondering myself, and... Um, I, I, it, there, we don't know. There's no, you know, no. Okay. No I mean, evidence. why not? Right. Some people, there's, you know, maybe the people with Tourette's is a real small number, right? I mean, uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm sure a very small part. I'm, I'm not asking you for I didn't statistics do, I, I at didn't all. Do that research. Not even Sorry. ask. No, no, I'm not asking. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, just even anecdote. We know that mm. there's a very small percentage of people have Tourette's. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, whether it's one percent or smaller, whatever. I don't know. But, but the point is, is that. It's very possible that you could be with something else, have a, some other sort of pathology or some other kind of experience, and then you also happen to get a second. It's just a roll of dice, you know what I mean? Right, right. So I'm... it's not necessarily have to be connected. I just thought maybe there was a, in this Kelvin's instance. Well, interestingly, the, it was the autism that um, was apparent that presented itself first, um, you know, when when I mm. was asking his parents the story of how, you know, they first discovered his disabilities, disabilities for years, they just thought it was autism. And then it wasn't until he was, I think, 12 or 13 that mm-hmm. the Tourette's started to emerge. Tease them apart, uh, these two things that were going on with him. Uh, well, what we did mention before, because I kept yammering on about it, was mainstreaming these children is a great for not only them, but also I think for everyone else, but that in this swim team, they're treated like the expectations are pretty high. There's a lot of pressure for, on these kids. They're not being, they're you know, not coddled. They're not being coddled at all. They're expected to deliver, to be on time, to practice, to compete at their fullest degree. And to win. They're and, expected to win. And to win. Wow. That's one of the reasons why I was so intrigued by Coach Mike, the coach of the team, and and the team before it was even a team, because I met him before the team came together, and he told me about his plans for the team. And he had, you know, he said, I think, early on that he wanted the team to dominate the competition, Mm -hmm. and I was just so struck by that because people don't usually talk that way about special needs kids. Uh, And... I thought that was, you know, fascinating and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, could make for an interesting story. You know, what Mm -hmm. happens when kids who, you know, most people have very low expectations for, you know, what happens when they have high expectations, you know, that are when, when, when people have high expectations for them, what happens? Well, in order to get the answer, see, see swim, uh, swim team, um, because, it will surprise you. Yeah. You focus on three other teenagers, essentially, right? It's the it's the Kelvin and... And, and Robbie and Mikey, and mm-hmm. they're on a relay team. And uh, I thought that it was really, you know, made a lot of sense to focus on them because they were on the relay team and they had to work mm-hmm. together. Uh, and people with autism generally have a lot of challenge with social socializing, social skills, and... It, swimming is an individual sport, but if mm-hmm. you're swimming on a relay team, you know, on your swim team, then you do have to interact with, with one another. And so it was uh, it was very intriguing um, to explore that. And I, I some of the, my favorite scenes in the movie are actually when the, the kids are interacting with one another, that verite footage of them, you know, talking amongst themselves and, you know, figuring out how to deal with each other. And it's not always... Um, smooth, you know. Sometimes Kelvin, he one of one of he has verbal tics. He's mm-hmm. the character with autism and Tourette's. He has verbal tics and he has um, body tics. And of his verbal tics, he swears all the time. And you know, he likes to say the f word. And it drives one other kid on the team bananas. And every time you know Kelvin says the f word, you know the other kid says, "You said the f word." <laughs> and it's uh it's it's shocking at first and and it's funny and you know Kelvin has you know these great responses like I curse a lot and yeah. <laughs> sorry uh, he's uh, the uh, he's tall tall kid right he's Kelvin isn't he um, a little bit tall it seems like he's I don't know if he's the tall if he's the Asian. tallest yeah but doesn't the other child understand intellectually that these are 
things that are out of Kelvin's control? I don't and... know. That's a good question. You know, he's the other one is on the spectrum as well. Yeah, and so... he knows he, he is, so he knows where all the kids are. Uh, they, well, anyway. Yeah, I wonder. You know, it's it's interesting to see, though, how that relationship develops yeah. through, through the film and how, you know, there's a scene at the end of the film where Kelvin gets, you know, really, really worked up and upset. And, you know, it's there's a moment of tension because you don't know what he's going to do. He's unpredictable. And um, it's this other this other team member uh, who helps to calm him down and says, you know, mm -hmm. gives him, you know, the strategies that he knows Kelvin can use, like count to 10, take a deep breath. That's one of my favorite moments, actually. Mm -hmm. That was going to make the final cut. <laughs> Speaking of which, do you have to now do a broadcast cut, or did you already have one? So I do. I'm in the middle of that right now, actually. I'm cutting it, it down. Be, oh, that must be really hard on you. It is. It is. Because um, this, you know, we have, the, this film is a sports story. and, right. and you know, really it's, relies on building attention and pacing. And, and right. we... we we left the races, you know, pretty um, intact. Like, they're almost to time, um, like they were in real life. And uh, the actual races. The swimming you races. Them, you know, a lot of the big portions in the film. So. Yes, yes. And I think that's one of the reasons why the film is so satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've certainly found screening it so far at film festivals and with community screenings that people who are into sports, you know, really think that it rings true mm -hmm. and they find it to be exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, that's, I think that's important. It's hard. It's really hard to cut stuff, you know? It's it's really hard. But Yeah, what's the theatrical length? <laughs> so the theatrical length is 100 minutes, uh -huh. and that's what, you know, we're, you know, we'll, we'll be showing at IFC Center when we open on July 7th. On July 7th, folks, just in case we left that out. Right, July 7th for the theatrical at the IFC Center, which is uh, terrific. Was that a result of uh, something at Dr. MYC? Or is that just no? no? Okay, I know that that's uh, if you know you win certain awards, you get a guaranteed week at the IC Center. No, but that that's that that's mm -mm. neither here nor there. Mm -mm. You got it on their, your own merit. That's great, and it couldn't hurt to have been in Doc NYC. You know, I'm sure John Banco and his folks knew about that, and you know that so, would be great. You know, yeah. yeah. So the kids, what are they? They must have shown up at some of those festivals or screenings early on. Or? Oh yeah, they were at Doc NYC. They were all up on stage. Oh, they were. I missed it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's 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 on YouTube because Doc NYC filmed that Q and A. Right. So if oh, anybody right. wants to see it, they can just can even... go on Doc and go on YouTube and you know search Doc NYC Swim Team. Q yeah, they have a channel. But it was wonderful um, to have them there, and it's. Uh, so they come with me to to screenings per their availability, and it's um and you know it's 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 never easy to get a group yeah. of of people together for screenings because everyone's so busy. But they're um they love the film. The mm -hmm. kids love the film. The families love the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm I'm really happy about that actually. Oh, I'm sure it's gonna feel great to have such support at this stage, especially while you're gearing up for theatrical and broadcast and all that yeah. so so it's interesting because it's like you say it's almost arbitrary any film you know you never know what's gonna the path it's gonna take but it seems like uh this has had a very um gratifying path for you as a filmmaker so far so good yes you know we've we've done a lot of um We've played a lot of festivals and, you know, we've been, um, you know, we've won a bunch of awards, which, you know, it's really great. And we're, we're doing a lot of community screenings. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, it lends itself, doesn't it? So, you know, that's really exciting. And I, I am excited about the theatrical release. Um, I think one thing we've learned, and you know, the experience of doing film festivals, you know, is invaluable. You just you get lots of information about, you know, what's working in your film um, and and who's responding to your film. And uh, it's it, it's been, you know, really important. And I realized that this is actually a film that plays well mm -hmm. theatrically. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not always the case with a with a documentary. Uh, but, you know, what's what's great about um, the theatrical experience is that people can hang out after and talk. And we have incredible conversations after after our screenings, um, and you know, really, it's an opportunity for for people to share their own experiences about their own uh, their own kids on the spectrum. You know, the own, their own problems that they've been having with finding um, 
inclusive activities and finding pathways for their own kids going through the transition years. Uh, and and it's important to be having these conversations because, you know, we do mm-hmm. have a, a public policy, you know, issue, I think, in our country with how we how we, um, you know, support um, individuals with with autism and developmental disabilities. Having said all that, we should also emphasize this is not a polemical film. It's it's really not. It's uh, it's it's about uh, you know competition and community and families. And there are certainly things you can take away. And there are definitely, I would think, the film rather lends itself to uh, you know institutional and educational types of uh, screenings and distribution. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that this is a advocacy. F- typically in the same typical way advocacy film it's not like you have a call to action per se not per se yeah. no i mean yeah i understand um so go and just expect to you know have a good time is the point yeah and i i think that you know certainly that those were my instincts that i wanted people to you know to to experience the journey you know that this this team and these families were on like you know the during the course of the season and it's you know, it's sometimes there are times where, you know, you might cry and there are times when you might laugh. Um, and I think there's times of tension. And oh, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for when... this somebody to show up at a, <laughs> at a, at a, uh, at a competition and they're... Oh, don't give it away. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> Will they make it or won't they? You have to see the film. Um... And there are times when people... I love that people actually cheer and clap oh, yeah. during the film. Uh-huh. And that's oh, really great. That's always a good thing, you know. Unless you're like the producers in the movie, the producers, in which case you don't want <laughs> you don't want the applause. No. No. Yes, of course. I, I'm assuming that it's a yeah, yeah. And it, as you said, the uh, the Q and A's are very, very. The conversations are are really, you know, terrific afterwards. So again, Lara Stallman is the director. The name of the film is Swim Team. It's going to be opening in New York at least. Uh, it's got to have a New Jersey. Uh, theatrical so we're going to be in new york for a week at the yeah, ifc center, center on and, july and again 7th starting july 7th mm-hmm. and then we're um we are definitely going to be in los angeles at mm-hmm. the lemley monica mm-hmm. uh and we are moving throughout the country from there uh okay. we're adding screenings like you know by the day so okay check our website oh, swimteamthefilm.com swimteamthefilm dot com and uh, do you have a you're on on Twitter yes and swim team the film on Twitter okay and, and Facebook Facebook swim team the film so subscribe and and follow like and everything else so you can keep uh, in touch about this film I'm sure I'm reaching some people who this might affect more than others in a very personal way so I think it's always great there's so many different ways into this issue of autism now it, through just through film and documentary you know what was Roger Ross Williams's film Life animated. Life animated. That was a pretty big success. That only helps, I think, other films on the subject. So you know, I think there's. I think so. You know, it's important. Yeah. It was a big hit. Yeah, I actually haven't seen it, so. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you were busy. Your hands were full. Comment. You're yes. making a movie. But he did the podcast. It was nice. Yeah, when you're making a movie, it you you don't. T- yeah, it's hard to watch other movies. <laughs> I, don't, I think it's good not to see it while you're making the film, too. It shouldn't impose itself on your process. Well, actually, I I did think about that, and mm. I didn't I didn't. Watch... I don't think the two are very, very different in many different respects. Mm. But I didn't. I actually didn't. You know, I made a point not to see it because yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to be influenced in any way. Um, right. Yeah, by yeah. it. But I was familiar with the story, and I thought that you know there is there's room for look there's room for for stories um and i think that you know because that character has autism you know doesn't mean that you know there isn't room for a story like swim team um with characters who have autism i I do i actually think that my that swim team isn't you know isn't just about autism no it's about lots of other stuff too yeah that's what i think i said i was trying to say earlier in terms of community and competition and Family. Family. As I, I think I used that term. I may have. But, yeah, you're right. And, in fact, you know, we've we've gotten support from people along the way who are not connected to autism, but they're connected to other things in the film. Like, for example, I have a producer who felt very hooked 
personally by the film because she's a parent. She's not a parent of kids with autism. Right. But because she's a parent, she felt, you know, very connected to the yeah, story. Yeah, these are just children. Everybody has the same feelings about their children, regardless. And we have, we've we've gotten um, some funding from, among others, the Aetna Foundation. And the Aetna Foundation supports um, films and enterprises and organizations that that emphasize the importance of healthy living, especially in underserved communities. So that was their way into the film. These are the insurance people? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Lara. I'm glad we were able to uh, meet up finally and and get this done. This was fun. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You bet. We're going to put this up in time for the theatrical, though. Even though you have all this great things on the horizon, I think it's this is where you can use the boost the most, right? The theatrical. So I think, and then we can just, I'll just put it out there again in time for your broadcast later on. You know, we'll just remind people, but this will premiere like days before your IFC theatrical, your, your Lemley Monica theatrical. <laughs> that would be great. Nice meeting you, or seeing you, I should say, Lara. And thank you, by the way, to the listening booth, the people at the listening booth where we recorded this today. Isn't this great? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and thank you for subscribing, for telling all your friends. Thank you for going on iTunes and leaving a review and a star rating. You know how to do that. You go to iTunes and you search Film Wax, and it comes up, and then you select Film Wax, and then you... If you're not already subscribed, you click on the subscribe button, and then you can also click on the rate and review, review this this podcast button, and go have at it. Please do do that, though, if you haven't done it, um, because I need to uh, be discovered more on iTunes. It's the biggest way people listen to podcasts by far. I forget the numbers, but I'm sure 80% at least of all podcast listeners are getting their experiencing experiencing the podcast off of iTunes. So we really need to uh, make the show discoverable. How do you do that? Well, you just do what I say. You subscribe and you leave a rating and a review. And uh, besides, I'd like to know what you're thinking, even if it's not always the most positive thing. You can also find us, of course, on Facebook if you go there uh, under Facebook slash facebook.com slash Filmwax Radio. And you can also find us on uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Yeah, that's about it, I guess, right now. I'm, I know I've been promising more on Spotify and on SoundCloud and others, and, and I will accomplish that as soon as I can. It, it, it will happen. It's in the works. So um, that's it. Okay, guys, I'm going to duck out of here. We'll be back in a few days with a brand new episode of the podcast. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of great guests coming up. I'm booking some really wonderful guests, by the way. But if you have a suggestion, as always, please do feel free to contact me by going to filmwaxradio.com and you'll see a uh, a link right there on the homepage where you can uh, email me, all right? And I do get everything. And if I don't respond immediately, that does not mean that I won't respond. I try to get to everybody. And if I don't, if you feel like I've ignored you, possibly I missed your email. Possibly it went into a spam folder. So feel free to follow up. I promise you, I am not ignoring you. I get back to everybody so far because I don't get that many emails I can certainly get back to you so if you're listening to this and you've emailed me and I've not responded to you first of all I'm sorry but secondly just just email me again or re-email me whatever you want to do uh, I promise I will get back but you can also use other forms of social media to nudge me and I will get back to you does that mean I can help everybody does that mean I can see every film does that mean I can I don't know have bring everybody on the podcast no it doesn't mean that but it does mean you deserve some attention by the way, I should mention, if you're still listening, if you are expecting me to watch your film, whether it's a short or a feature or otherwise, please just send me the link to the whole thing or tell me where I can go see it. I generally can't get to the theater, but if you're at a local festival not too far from New York, I can try to come to that. If you are doing a special screening in New York, the New York area, I can try to come to that. So feel free to invite me, and I try to get to what I can. Uh, and then as far as just viewing it on my computer, of course, that's that's optimal. And I do get to see almost everything people send me that in that way, okay? It doesn't mean that I'm going to love everything I see, but of course, you know that. 
And it doesn't mean that even if I don't, that I won't give you feedback or whatever it is you're asking for. I just need to know. And people send me the trailer as maybe a way to engage me. But the truth is, if you just send me the link to the film and the trailer in one email, that's easiest. Okay. I I do I do see more, almost everything that uh, people send me. Thank you very much, by the way, for, for just even thinking of doing that. It's an honor, and I, that's why I do try to see and everything people send me, and I do try to respond to everybody because it, it's an honor. It's a privilege to to be on, in, on your mind or in your thoughts as somebody who, you know, you think should see it. So thanks for that. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. This is uh, Adam Shartoff, your host of Film Wax Radio. We're presented by Rooftop Films. And until next time, uh, take care of yourself and the ones you, you love.